chapter seven, mainly about the, uh, mainly about dwarves. The two Kalermine soldiers at the head of the column, seeing what they took for a Tarkin or great lord with two armed pages, came to a halt and raised their spears in salute. Oh, my master, said one of them, we lead these mannequins to Kalermine to work in the mines of the Tisrock. May he live forever. By the great god Tosh, they are very obedient, said Tyrion. Then suddenly he turned to the dwarves themselves. About one in six of them carried a torch, and by that flickering light he could see their bearded faces all looking at him with grim and dogged expressions. Has the Tisrock fought a great battle, dwarves, and conquered your land? he asked. That thus you go patiently to die in the salt pits of Pugraham? The two soldiers glared at him in surprise, but the dwarves all answered, Aslan's orders, Aslan's orders. He sold us. What can we do against him? Tis rock indeed, added one and spat. I'd like to see him try it. Silence, dogs, said the chief soldier. Look, said Tyrion, pulling puzzle forward into the light. It has all been a lie. Aslan has not come to Narnia at all. You have been cheated by the ape. This is the thing he brought out of the stable to show you. Look at it. What the dwarves saw, now they could see it close, was certainly enough to make them wonder how they had ever been taken in. The lion's skin had gotten pretty untidy already during Puzzle's imprisonment in the stable, and it had been knocked crooked during his journey through the dark wood. Most of it was in a big lump on one shoulder. The head, besides being pushed sideways, had somehow gotten got very far back so that anyone could now see his silly, gentle, donkeyish face gazing out of it. Some grass stuck out of one corner of his mouth, where he'd been doing a little quiet nibbling as they brought him along. And he was muttering, It wasn't my fault. I'm not clever. I never said I was. For one second, all the dwarves were staring at Puzzle with wide open mouths, and then one of the soldiers said sharply, Are you mad, my master? What are you doing to the slaves? And the other said, And who are you? Neither of their spears were at the salute now. Both were down and ready for action. Give the password, said the chief soldier. This is my password, said the king as he drew his sword. The light is dawning, the lie broken. Now guard thee, miscreant. For I am Tyrion of Narnia. He flew upon the chief soldier like lightning. Eustace, who had drawn his sword when he saw the king draw his, rushed at the other one. His face was deadly pale, but I wouldn't blame him for that. And he had the luck that beginners sometimes do have. He forgot all that Tyrion had tried to teach him that afternoon, slashing wildly. Indeed, I'm not sure his eyes weren't shut and suddenly found, to his own great surprise, that the Calamine lay dead at his feet. And though that was a great relief, and though that was a great relief, it was, at the moment, rather frightening. The king's fight lasted a second or two longer. Then he, too, had killed his man and shouted to Eustace, Where are the other two? But the dwarves had settled the two remaining Calamines. There was no enemy left. Well struck, Eustace, cried Tyrion, clapping him on the back. Now, dwarves, you are free. Tomorrow I will lead you to free Narnia, to free all Narnia. Three cheers for Aslan. But the result which followed was simply wretched. There was a feeble attempt from a few dwarves, about five, which died away all at once. From several others they, there were sulky growls. Many said nothing at all. Don't they understand, said Jill impatiently. What's wrong with all you dwarves? Don't you hear what the king says? It's all over. The ape isn't going to rule Narnia any longer. Everyone can go back to ordinary life. We can have fun again. Aren't you glad? After a pause of nearly a minute, a not very nice looking dwarf with hair and beard as black as soot said, And who might you be, missy? I'm Jill, she said. The same Jill who rescued King Rillian from the enchantment. And this is Eustace. Who did it too and we've come back from another world after hundreds of years as land sent us
The dwarves all looked at one another with grins, sneering grins, not merry ones. Well, said the black dwarf, whose name was Griffel. I don't know how all you chaps feel, but I feel I've heard a, I've heard as much about Aslan as I want to for the rest of my life. That's right, that's right, growled the other dwarves. It's all a plant, all a blooming plant. What do you mean, said Tyrion? He had not been pale when he was fighting, but he was pale now. He had thought this was going to be a beautiful moment, but it was turning out more like a bad dream. You must think we're blooming soft in the head that you must, said Griffel. We've been taken in once, and now you expect us to be taken in again the next minute? We've no more use for stories about Aslan. See? Look at him, an old mope with long ears. By heaven, you make me mad, said Tyrion. Which of us said that was Aslan? That is the ape's imitation of the real Aslan, can't you understand? And you've got a better imitation, I suppose, said Griffel. No thanks. We've been fooled once, and we're not going to be fooled again. I have not, said Tyrion, angrily. I serve the real Aslan. Where is he? Who's he? Show him to us, said several dwarves. Do you think I keep him in my wallet, fools? said Tyrion. Who am I that I could make Aslan appear at my bidding? He's not a tame lion. The moment those words were out of his mouth, he realized he, that he had made a false move. The dwarfs at once began repeating, Not a tame lion, not a tame lion, in a jeering sing-song. That's what the other lot kept on telling us, said one. Do you mean you don't believe in the real Aslan, said Jill? But I've seen him, and he has sent us two here out of a different world. Ah, said Griffel with a broad smile, so you say. They've taught you your stuff, all right, saying your lessons, ain't you? Churl, cried Cheerion, will you give a lady the lie to her very face? You keep a civil tongue in your head, mister, replied the dwarf. <clears throat> I don't think we want any more t kings if you are Tyrion, which you don't look like him, no more than we want any Aslans. We're going to look after ourselves from now on and touch our caps to nobody, see? That's right, said the other dwarves. We're on our own now. No more Aslan, no more kings, no more silly stories about other worlds. The dwarves are for the dwarves. And they began to fall into their places and to get ready for marching back to wherever they had come from. Little beasts, said Eustace, aren't you even going to say thank you for being saved from the salt mines? Oh, we know all about that, said Griffel over his shoulder. You wanted to make use of us, that's why you rescued us. You're playing some game of your own. Come on, ch come on, you chaps. And the dwarves struck up the queer little marching song which goes with the drumbeat, and off they trampled into the darkness. Tyrion and his friends stared after them. Then he said a single word. Come. And they continued their journey. They were a silent party. Puzzle felt himself to be still in disgrace, and also he didn't really quite understand what had happened. Jill, besides being disgusted with the dwarves, was very impressed with Eustace's victory over the Calorme, and felt almost shy. As for Eustace, his heart was still beating rather quickly. Tyrion and Jewel walked sadly together in the rear. The king had his arm on the unicorn's shoulder, and sometimes the unicorn nuzzled the king's cheek with his soft nose. They did not try to comfort one another with words. It wasn't very easy to think of anything to say that would be comforting. Tyrion had never dreamed that one of the results of an ape's setting up a false Aslan would be to stop people from believing in the real one. He had felt quite sure that the dwarves would rally to his side the moment he showed them how they had been deceived. And the next night, he would have led them to Stable Hill, and shown puzzle to all the creatures, and everyone would have turned against the ape, and perhaps after a scuffle with the Calamines, the whole thing would have been over. But now, it seemed, he could count on nothing. How many other Narnians might turn the same way as the dwarves? Somebody's coming after us, I think, said Puzzle suddenly. <clears throat> they stopped and listened. Sure enough, there was a thump-thump of small feet behind them. 
Who goes there? shouted the king. Only me, sire, came a voice. Me, Poggin, the dwarf. I've only just managed to get away from the others. I'm on your side, sire, and on Aslan's. If you can put a dwarfish sword in my fist, I'd gladly strike a blow on the right side before it's all done. Everyone crowded round him and welcomed him, praised him and slapped him on the back. Of course, one single dwarf could not make a very great difference, but it was somehow very cheering to have even one. The whole party brightened up, but Jill and Eustace didn't stay bright for very long, for they were now yawning their heads off and too tired to think about anything but bed. It was at the coldest hour of the night, just before dawn, when they got back to the tower. If there had been a meal ready for them, they would have been glad enough to eat, but the bother and delay of getting one was not to be thought of. They drank from a stream, splashed their faces with water, and tumbled into their bunks, except for Puzzle and Jewel, who said they'd be more comfortable outside. This perhaps was just as well, for a unicorn and a fat, full-grown donkey indoors always make a room feel rather crowded. Narnian dwarves, though less than four feet high, are for their size about the toughest and strongest creatures there are, so that Poggin, in spite of a heavy day and late night, woke fully refreshed before any of the others. He at once took Jill's bow, went out and shot a couple of wood pigeons. Then he sat plucking them on the doorstep and chatting to Jewel and Puzzle. Puzzle looked and felt a good deal better this morning. Jewel being a unicorn, and therefore one of the noblest and most delicate of beasts, had been very kind to him, talking to him about things of the sort they could both understand, like grass and sugar and the care of one's hooves. When Jill and Eustace came out of the tower yawning and rubbing their eyes at almost half-past ten, the dwarf showed them where they could gather plenty of an Arnian weed called wild fresni which looks rather like our wood soil, but tastes a good deal nicer when cooked. It needs a little butter and pepper to make it perfect, but they hadn't these. So that what with one thing and another, they had the makings of a capital stew for their breakfast or dinner, whichever you choose to call it. Tyrion went a little further off into the wood with an axe and brought back some branches for fuel. While the meal was cooking, which seemed a very long time, especially as it smelled nicer and nicer than ere it came to being done, the king found a complete dwarfish outfit for Poggin. Mail shirt, helmet, shield, sword, belt, and dagger. Then he inspected Eustace's sword, and found that Eustace had put it back in the sheath all messy from killing the Callerman. He was scolded for that and made to clean and polish it. All this while Jill went to and fro, sometimes stirring the pot and sometimes looking out enviously at the donkey and the unicorn who were contentedly grazing. How many times that morning she wished she could eat grass. <clears throat> but when the meal came, everyone felt it had been worth waiting for, and there were second helpings all around. When everyone had eaten as much as he could, the three humans and the dwarf came and sat down on the doorstep. The four-footed ones lay down facing them. The dwarf, with permission from both Jill and from Tyrion, lit his pipe. And the king said, Now, friend Poggin, you have more news of the enemy be like than we. Tell us what you know. At first, what tale do they tell of my escape? As cunning a tale, sire, as we'd ever as ever was devised, said Poggin. It was the cat Ginger who told it and most likely made it up too. This ginger sire, oh, he's a sly boots if a cat ever was, said he was walking past the tree to which those villains bound your majesty, and he said, saving your reverence, that you were howling and swearing and cursing Aslan. Language I wouldn't like to repeat were the words he used, looking ever so prim and proper. You know the way a cat can when it pleases. And then, says Ginger, Aslan himself suddenly appeared in a flash of lightning and swallowed your majesty up in one, at one mouthful. All the beasts trembled at the story, and some fainted right away. And, of course, the ape followed it up. There, he says, 
see what Aslan does to those who don't respect him. Let that be a warning to you all. All the poor creatures wailed and whined and said, It will, it will. So that in the upshot, your majesty's escape has not set them thinking whether you still have loyal friends to aid you, but only made them more afraid and more obedient to the ape. What devilish policy, said Tyrion. This ginger, then, is close to in the ape's councils? It's more a question by now, sire, if the ape is in his councils, replied the dwarf. The ape has been taken to drinking, you see. My belief is that the plot is now mostly carried on by Ginger, or Rishta. That's the Calarmine captain. And I think some words that Ginger has scattered among the dwarves are chiefly to blame for the scurvy return they made to you. And I'll tell you why. One of those dreadful midnight meetings had just broken up the night before last, and I'd gone a bit of the way home when I'd found I'd left my pipe behind. It was a real good un, an old favorite, so I went back to look for it. But before I got to the place where I'd been sitting, it was black as pitch there. I heard a cat's voice say, Mew, and a calamine voice say, Here, speak softly. So I just stood as still as if I was frozen, and these two were Ginger and Rishta Tarkin, as they call him. Noble Tarkin, said the cat in that silky voice of his. I just wanted to know exactly what we both meant today about Aslan, Aslan meaning no more than Tosh. Doubtless, most sagacious of cats, says the other, you have perceived my meaning. You mean, says Ginger, that there's no such person as either. All who are enlightened know that, said the Tarkin. Then we can understand one another, purrs the cat. Do you, like me, grow a little weary of the ape? A stupid, greedy brute, says the other, but we must use him for the present. Thou and I must provide for all things in secret and make the ape do our will. And it would be better, wouldn't it, said Ginger, to let some of the more enlightened Arnians into our council, one by one as we find them out. For the beasts who really believe in Aslan may turn at any moment, and will, if the ape's folly betrays his secret. But those who care neither for Tosh nor Aslan, but have only an eye to their own profit, and such reward as the Tisrock may give them when Narnia is a Calarmine province, will be firm. Excellent, cat, said the captain, but choose which ones carefully. While the dwarf had been speaking, the day seemed to have changed. It had been sunny when they sat down. Now Puzzle shivered. Jules shifted his head uneasily. Jill looked up. It's clouding over, she said. And it's so cold, said Puzzle. Cold enough by the lion, said Tyrion, blowing on his hands. And fa, what foul smell is this? Phew, gasped Eustace. It's like something dead. Is there a dead bird somewhere about? And why didn't we notice it before? With a great upheaval, Jewel scrambled to his feet and pointed with his horn. Look, he cried. Look at it. Look, look. Then all six of them saw, and over all their faces there came an expression of uttermost dismay. <laughs>